Welcome to Quinn's Next Step. I'm Quinn. Today we got Quinn's Quick Picks with Peyton Ware. Let me introduce you to the creative director at the studios at Fisher. Thanks for uh, being with me here today, Peyton. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. What better way to have this conversation than a uh, smoky back room with cigars and bourbon? Uh, smoky back, back porch. Back porch indeed. As you know, we got the beautiful hill country here mm -hmm. behind us. Mm -hmm. Well, before we get started, let me ask you, what did you think about the second GOP debate being held at the Air Force One hangar uh, at the Reagan Library? You know, it was, uh, he seems to be the, the main uh, focus of GOP lore these days, right? When they want to talk about the old traditional GOP and... Uh, oh yeah, everybody wants that election where they have, what was it, all 50 states or 48, 49 out of 50? Yeah. Yeah, like he had, in, like Reagan had in his second election. Yes, yes. But um, great event uh, or great venue. I mean, it was a great venue. Um, you know, when you go to the circus, it seems exciting. Seems like maybe it's a good idea, but the clowns are creepy, and you really just end up feeling sorry for the elephants. And I think that's kind of how it went for me. Yeah, as far as soon as I saw that Air Force One plane, I I just thought of. Uh, Air Force One, the movie, <laughs> get off my plane, <laughs> is the first thing I thought every time I saw that plane, because I believe it was the same one modeled for the movie. And I would have loved to seen Harrison Ford debating that that night. He probably could have done a lot better. I think he probably would have carried it. You know? Maybe so. He might have my vote tonight. We don't know. I will say this. I thought the moderators were okay, and I know you might want to talk about that specifically later, but... Uh, had trouble um, understanding the the um, the young lady from Telemundo, I believe it was. Oh yes, and the uh, who was the Brit? Uh, Stuart Varney. He struggled a little bit, uh, some stumbles and some bumbles, well, and couldn't really keep control of the crowd. You know, it, it wasn't really fair. I mean, Dana Perino was the um, White House spokesperson for Bush, so she knows, and she's been on the Five. She's been with Fox for so long on Fox Business, occasionally with this one, mm -hmm. but normally she's just on the Fox News Network or Fox News Channel. She did good, she did all right. I had some thoughts about some of the things well, that we'll, she threw out. But. We'll watch uh, some of the uh, clips I have for uh, Dana Perino a little bit later. Mm. Well, wait, can I ask you this? Yeah. Before leading into this debate, did you have a first pick in this group that's gonna be on stage and did that change after the debate? I really had no expectations going into this debate, into this debate after the first one. Um, I know the first one, Vivek Ramaswamy really knocked it out of the park, I thought. Uh -huh. um, his one mess up line in the first debate was actually probably one of his best lines, pointing out that everybody else on stage was bought and paid for, as they are all government uh, career politicians working for the taxpayer dollar mm -hmm. and really the power that comes with the offices that they hold. Yeah. yeah. And so this time I noticed Vivek went ahead and tried to speak up his colleagues to try to make up for that. And I don't think that worked to his benefit because the rest of uh, his colleagues up there on stage were just hammering him left and right. They were out for blood. For sure. Especially for that one comment that yeah. they're all bought and paid for, yeah. which, I mean, none the, truth, of them the truth hurts, doesn't it? None of them proved him <laughs> false. Yeah. So, I mean, they all have to have so many small donations even to get up on the stage. So I'm sure that they all have plenty of great supporters. Um, but the elephant not in the room, Donald Trump really put a spin on the whole thing but for the most part we'll just leave him out of this conversation uh for tonight let's get to it i'm ready i'm pumped all right let's uh start off with this first clip from vivek ramaswamy mr ramaswamy you've said you really empathize with the strikers you're standing next to senator scott and do you agree with what he said or do you think he's wrong i agree with some of what he said for sure i like the spirit of it I'll say that I don't have a lot of patience for the union bosses. I think that's where he and I actually have a common view. I do have a lot of sympathy for the workers, however. People are going through real hardship in this country. I've been through hardship growing up. 
My father stared down layoffs at GE under Jack Welch's tenure at the GE plant in Evendale, Ohio. My mom had to work overtime in nursing homes in Southwest Ohio to make ends meet and pay off our home loan. So I understand that hardship is not a choice, but victimhood is a choice. And we choose to be victorious in the United States of America. You know what, if I was giving advice to those workers, I would say go picket in front of the White House in Washington, D.C. That's really where the protest needs to be. Disastrous economic policies that have driven up prices, that have driven up interest rates and mortgage rates. At the same time, wages remaining stagnant. What we need is to deliver economic growth in this country. Unlock American energy. Drill, frack, burn coal, embrace nuclear energy. Put people back to work by no longer paying them more money to stay at home. Stabilize the U.S. dollar itself and rescind a majority of those unconstitutional federal regulations that are hampering our economy. That is how we unleash American exceptionalism. And that's not a Democratic vision or a Republican vision. That is an American vision that we embrace economic growth and capitalism is still the best system known to man to lift us up from poverty. Poverty, and we should not apologize for it. That's what it means to be an American. My goodness. Can we vote now? Can we just vote? Can we just get this over with? I'm ready. Uh, unfortunately not, but <laughs> obviously you like the Vic Ramaswamy. I do, I do. What were some of the uh, points he made that really jumped out at you for that one? Well, obviously his great line about the picketers should move to Washington, D.C. They should be protesting the federal government. I agree. You know, you can blame the, the mob attachments to the unions and the bosses there. You can um, blame the workers for asking too much, throw the blame all over. But I think he's got a point when he says it falls on these regulations and the, the ties with the government is always what brings it up and brings the quality down, brings the cost up and brings the quality down with this kind of stuff. So, so he's basically saying that they uh, should be picketing uh, the other people on the stage. Correct. The governors <laughs> and the senators yeah. of well, all these specifically states. Specifically Washington, D.C., but yes. Well, the senators, these career yeah. career politicians, right. yeah. I mean, I love the guy. That's, you know, that sounds presidential to me. I know that that's kind of become a cliche, but it really does. Uh, definitely what he said in regards to uh, cutting back regulation, all the red tape uh, for industry and innovation. Definitely want to open up the spigots on that because everybody is so afraid of making a mistake. It's like, well, if we don't try something, how are we going to improve something? Yeah. Well, everybody's too afraid because of overregulation that to even try to do something different. I mean, energy, he's big on the energy unleashing it all. I think that's going to be tough hill for him politically when he's talking about burn as much coal as possible. But I don't disagree. I mean, well, cheap, that's what they're doing. Cheap energy in and energy power, um, energy excuse me, cheap energy and, um, you know, utilizing all of our resources to generate power is the best way to lift people out of poverty. It's the best way to boost our economy, as he mentioned. Um, and he mentioned nuclear as well, which I think if, if you're interested in being uh, part of uh, green energy or renewables, that uh, nuclear has nuclear to be Nuclear definitely has to be part of, of the conversation, conversation definitely. Yeah. So I thought it was a great point. Great opener. Go Vivek. Bing! Yeah, so our second clip uh, starts off with Ron DeSantis and leads into a little bit of a debate with uh, Tim Scott and Vivek Ramaswamy. Governor DeSantis, China invested $12 billion in Latin America just last year. They signed strategic partnerships with seven countries, including Mexico. And China's military ties to the region now include arms sales and training exercises. Are you comfortable with China deepening ties with our southern neighbors? Of course not. And the reason why we're in this mess is because elites in D.C. for far too long have chosen surrender over strength when it comes to the CCP. Some people in our country got rich, our industrial base got hollowed out, and they have been able to build the second most powerful military in the entire world. We need a totally new approach to China. We are going to have real hard power in the Indo-Pacific, like Reagan, to deter their ambitions. We're going to have economic independence from China, where we're decoupling our economy. And 
and we are going to go after the cultural power they have in this country. As governor of Florida, I banned the CCP from buying land in our state. We should do that all across these United States. We shouldn't have them in our universities. We shouldn't have Confucius Institutes. So what you see a country in decline, our power's in decline. China's going to surpass us this decade, and if they do that, that's going to affect every single American household. As your president, I am not going to let that happen. I'm going to reverse this country's decline. We are going to choose strength, not surrender, when it comes to the CCP. America. So we got our first round of China bashing in. I'm sure there will be plenty of that, or uh, there's plenty of that to go throughout the night. Um, I understand that there are concerns there. I think they're overblown. I think it's kind of hyperbolic scapegoating. China's dem demographics are such that, especially after the one child policy, that they have no young people left in their country. Their demographic shape balloons out at the top. And that means they're running out of young workers and taxpayers and consumers to keep the economy going. Is that why they expanded to Hong Kong before their they're, one China they're policy They're trying to do up? everything they can, of course, but Building it's, islands. It's a party of one. It's one guy. He makes all the decisions. He's cut off and he insulated himself from any information coming in. And they import almost all of their energy, most of their food, most of their fertilizer. China's not this great powerhouse that, you know, is going to come take over the world. Now, they might be the but, ones that slip in when we are so weak and fighting against ourselves that they could cause some real problems. Well, here's uh, the question I have. Uh, with that is that I think the biggest thing with China is that they have a population of 2 billion people versus the United States, 330 million right around there. So they have the workforce to do the manufacturing jobs. But they're all aging out. And so that, that means that workforce. Well, they have just the men because like you said, with the one child policy, it was the boys that survive and they're the ones that are filling in all these jobs. Right. And is, so I don't believe that America can get those manufacturing jobs back just by the numbers. Right. They take out our entire population with only uh, one sixth of theirs. Right. Or would match ours. Right. So if only, say, 40% of our population even works, let alone in manufacturing, we're talking way under 150. 150, 175 million people would all we'd have left to get those jobs. Right. So yeah, I mean, it's definitely uh, so a So where big do competitor. we find cheap labor is the question for that one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mexico is actually uh, very competitive with labor prices right now, and the quality is better. Um, in the last, I don't know, I think it's five years or so that that's, that trend has been... Um, moving in that direction. A lot of the jobs in China moved into other areas in the Indo-Pacific region because the costs were going up there and trade uh, tensions and things like that. Feels like a little bit of uh, fear-mongering, uh, beating the war drums. Uh, I don't want to say that China is not a concern, but... What you man mentioned with Mexico, yeah, Trump had put in place the Canada-Mexico trade agreement. The new NAFTA. Right. And which so, is great for us. Uh, that has seemed to um, benefit quite a few people from what I've seen and heard. Um, yeah, having more of this manufacturing in Central or even Southern America would make more sense because if a lot of these people are looking to come to America, if they can stop somewhere south of the border instead of trying to make the harsh track um, across the desert to cross the southern border illegally, probably not the best way to go. Even as an asylum seeker, you'd have to go before a court to prove that you needed to seek asylum. Hmm. But if the businesses, if more businesses were, say, south of the border, maybe uh, less people from, say, South America would continue those dangerous treks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think there's a certain percentage of immigrants coming in now that are uh, from China, my understanding. Um, they're not just coming from Mexico or South America. We're getting a lot of influx from all over the world. I don't know, DeSantis seems like somebody who's gonna do a lot of sab saber rattling and uh, you know, aggravating uh, 
uh, with the China, the whole China issue, and um, he wants to take a strong stand on it. I, I understand that it's going to be popular with the party, but I think we got to be careful about that. Uh, we shouldn't be looking for d dragons to slay. Um, we shouldn't be, you know, uh, provoking these other world powers just because. You know, the whole storyline is, oh, they're about to surpass us. They're not going to surpass us. If we stopped patrolling the seas and kept the trade routes open for the world, China wouldn't be able to get any of their food or their energy or anything. They, they, it's the security of the seas which we provide, which allows them, you know, and our, tra our trading partnership with them, which benefited them maybe uh, um, unequally. What's the the trade balance? Trade imbalance? Yeah, imbalance. Yeah. You know, for some time, still without, without us, I think, you know, Unless we're just going to go full on, like, let's start lava nukes, and in which case, you know. Yeah, it doesn't help the uh, consumer or the worker. No. By any no. stretch of the imagination. No. Uh, for Ron DeSantis, I will say this. He does seem to do a lot better in his one-on-one -on -one interviews. But when he's in a uh, big group, say like these last two debates, uh, it's just too much competition for him. He doesn't get the focus. I think he is uh, maybe a lot more like myself where... When it's one-on-one, -on -one, I have great conversations, but you put me in a big group and it's just too convoluted to actually have any kind of meaningful conversation. And so even in that situation, I would step back. He did try to jump up a little bit more in this one than he did in the first one. But from what I've seen, most people forget that he's even there during these debates. Um, and he likes to speak about his great record in Florida, which I can't say anything negative about. I think he was a good governor, a but, really good governor. But how was he able to be a good governor? He has a state house and Senate that supports him. As an American president, we already know he is not going to have a federal house and Senate that will support him. Maybe they will, he used to be a senator, right? So he played in the DC swamp before, right. before he became governor and now he wants to go back to the swamp as the president i think if it is a uh, policy driven i think he would do a, a great job um managing the country in that way but without the support that he had down in florida i just don't see him being able to get a whole lot of it done it's wild that he hasn't been able to capitalize on that because he did have in my opinion the strongest platform not platform, but the strongest position that he was coming to the table from in that he had during COVID and, and standing up um, and also some of this culture war stuff. Think about it, what you will, as far as his methods of resolving that. But he's been stalwart in that. And that gave him a great spot to launch from. But it's kind of fizzled. I feel like he hasn't, you know, he hasn't really focused on his accomplishments and that enough that that's what he should be selling himself as. Um, well, I think that could be a double-edged sword because if you're too busy focusing on your past accomplishments and not enough focus on what you're going to do in your future position or opportunity, um, I think the message can get lost that you're uh, resting on your laurels mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. too much. Okay. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. We'll see and where I, he does. He he was at the top of the pack. He hasn't really leapt that far forward, but he's uh, there. He's still solid, DeSantis. So indeed, we'll see where it goes. All right, let's get to the next one. What do we got? What's next here? You and retreat. propose quote universal deportation for all undocumented immigrants and their children, even if the children are citizens of the United States. Under what legal premise will you expel U.S. citizens? So the first thing I want to say is I agree with everything. The Republicans on the stage are on the right side of this issue. Militarize the southern border, stop funding sanctuary cities, and end foreign aid to Mexico and Central America to end the incentives to come across. But I do go a step further. You're right about that, Ilya. I favor ending birthright citizenship for the kids of illegal immigrants in this country. Now, the left will howl about the Constitution and the 14th Amendment. The difference between me and them is I've actually read the 14th Amendment. What it says is that all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the laws and jurisdiction thereof 
are citizens. So nobody believes that the kid of a Mexican diplomat in this country enjoys birthright citizenship. Not a judge or legal scholar in this country will disagree with me on that. Well, if the kid of a Mexican diplomat doesn't enjoy birthright citizenship, then neither does the kid of an illegal migrant who broke the law to come here. And as the father of two sons, it is hard for me to look them in the eye and say, you have to follow the law when our own government fails to follow its own laws. That's how we really go the distance and solve this problem and restore the rule of law in the United States of America because that is part of what it even means to be an American. Senator Scott. Wow. Now there's a statement. <laughs> I, that was a twist that I did not see coming. Um, I don't know that anybody did. Did you see DeSantis's face when he was talking? Yeah. Kind of a... Did not did, see that one he, coming at all. This? Yeah. Um, where... Yeah, the, I think the term that they used prior to this was the anchor baby um, method of an illegal coming over just to give birth to their kid so that way their kid would have citizenship mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. through basically default, the parents would eventually get it as well through the kid. I mean, from a constitutional technical standpoint, like that's a really actually an excellent point. Again, I think he... He does things that are politically dangerous to him, which almost makes me trust him a little more sometimes. I don't think anybody else on the stage, and somebody's going to imitate it right after he says it, but I don't think anybody else on the stage would have led with that if he hadn't brought it up. Well, everybody uh, always brings up, it's like, yeah, as long as you're born on this property, yes. they never bring up the second portion Part of, of that yeah. is, and under the jurisdiction thereof. Well, if I'm currently in Texas and I go to Arizona, I'm still under the jurisdiction of Texas as a Texan with my driver's license. When I get pulled over, I, they're not going to throw me in jail because of us being the United States. Correct. So my Texas ID will work as a driver in, say, Arizona, but I'm still under the driver's licensing of Texas even yeah. if I'm driving another state. So I can see where his argument is going with that. And if that's what the amendment says, if it stands up to Supreme Court ruling, I... And what a great line. Yeah, the left will it, howl about the 14th Amendment, but the difference between me and them is that I've actually read it. I mean... It's yeah, that was good. Pretty funny and, and probably pretty accurate. Uh, I think it's a bold call. Um, something needs to be done. Uh, it does seem to be a very tough one, which in some demographics is probably going to be a diff difficult. And I was stationed down at Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas. And I mean, the border down there, uh, the legal crossing, legal crossings happen all the time. The Juarez is 3 million people strong in Mexico, right across the Rio Grande from El Paso, whereas El Paso is maybe 300, 350,000 people of population. So a lot of the times people from El Paso will want to do some shopping in Mexico. They legally cross over to Juarez, do their shopping, and then cross back into El Paso. And the Mexicans, Mexican nationals in Juarez do the same thing. They will cross legally, do their shopping at the local Walmart, and cross back. I'm a fan of legal immigration. I think more is better. More skilled labor, more... Um, yeah, what more happened opportunities. to uh, Donald Trump's big gate, big but, beautiful door? Yeah, that isn't... yeah. But you know, going by the law of the land is what we should be doing, or we should change the laws. I think that's kind of where I come down on it. Good point. Another yeah, when you have uh, immigration numbers that we've been seeing, uh, illegal immigration, just the ones that they've caught, not even the getaways, the numbers that they're throwing at us is bigger than some of the. Uh, maybe smaller cities or even the smaller states that we have. Right, right. So how can we um, bring this many people in, get them jobs, get them housing, and get them into our economic system as quickly as possible? Naturalization, uh, you know, get them involved in the, in the civics of the country if they want to do it and have them go through the proper channels. Well, we did I mention think that's uh, Ronald I think that's Reagan, fair. and they mentioned that Ronald Reagan gave amnesty to millions of undocumented documented, uh, immigrants in the 80s. No, I didn't but know this. No other president has done it since. Mm. 
Interesting. And so maybe that was one of the things that he did to get that red wave in his second election. Hmm. Interesting. I have to, if you know, please leave a message in the comments. I did not research that before we started filming. News to me. Yeah. All right, what's yeah. next? What's next? News to me. And so now we got uh, Tim Scott's response to uh, Vivek's uh, immigration. You oppose ending birthright citizenship. What does Mr. Ramaswamy have wrong on that issue? Yeah, there's no doubt the fact that, that when you think of the Constitution in the 14th Amendment, it was certainly written as it relates to slavery, not as it relates to illegal immigration. It's been applied to illegal immigration. So the challenge that we face is, in fact, one that has to do with whether or not the people that come here are under the jurisdiction of our laws. And frankly, if you come here illegally, you are not. Now, so surviving a Supreme Court argument is something I can't tell you. But from a perspective of the Constitution, I think it's simple that Clearly, it was designed for slavery and not for illegal immigration. I'll go one step further, though. When we have a conversation about the things that are happening on this stage, we think about the fact that Vivek just said we were all good people. And I appreciate that because last debate, he said we were all bought and paid for. And I thought about that for a little while and said, you know, I can't imagine how you can say that knowing that you were just in business with the Chinese Communist Party and the same people that funded Hunter Biden millions of dollars was a part. I said, Senator Scott, we were talking about immigration. Yeah, that attack came out of nowhere. He was just holding he it. Was, he was waiting. He was waiting for a zinger to attack him on what happened in the past debate. So I guess my question is, why are you bringing up old shit? Senator Scott, so you're running for president. What do you think we should do about immigration? Well, obviously, this is about slavery. And Vivek working with the Chinese. Great. Good plan. All right. Glad you got that figured out. Let's watch them uh, argue that one out. Oh. It's not nonsense. So look, do you, do you here's not, what I, 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 I want to respond. These, these are good people who are tainted by a broken system. And it's not the fault I, I of anybody who's involved. Some of us are tainted with bottom line. Excuse me. Line excuse bottom me. Bottom excuse me. Not. Thank you for speaking while I'm interrupting. Literally. While I'm speaking. Well, no, you said bottom paper. If I may finish. You'll have your turn. You can't be on both sides. Gentlemen, you'll have your turn. One of the challenges we should have a debate between the two. We know what the business in China. May, Everybody knows that. If I may, if Let's I may focus address, on holding Joe Biden if, if accountable. Question, That's what I, we need to be I actually agree on. with Ron well, DeSantis. Everybody speak at the same time. I, no one can understand Exactly. Your so if I may, I agree with Ron DeSantis on China. When every other CEO expanded into the Chinese market, you know what I did with my first company? We opened a subsidiary in China. But you know what I did that was different than every other company? We got the hell out of there. And when I started my yeah, next right company, you ran Strive, part. right when I started no, years ago. Right when I started my next company, it's, Strive, to compete against BlackRock. Excuse me. No, no. To compete against it's BlackRock, I made a commitment that we would never Mr. do business Russell. in China. And I will say Mr. something. Mr. Yes. I think you have more than time to explain yeah. your point. Well, if I, I was interrupted by a lot of people here, and I want to be respectful I've because I yeah. believe these people. You were respectful people, last debate. But I do not believe in these. We're sitting here in the Reagan Library. Yes, I wish you would do not. In the honor of Ronald Reagan's library, if I may, well, from one, I, Tim, listen, from one hey, admirer listen, of Ronald all, Reagan all to I'm another, asking you, I'm asking from you. one admirer of Reagan to another, Did we cannot do deals with the CCP. This isn't productive. I, I want to hear about that. Let's have, have a even policy even debate. What's going on? Let us have a policy debate. Let's have about their record. Let's have a policy debate. And the right answer. I'll drink to that. Good lord, indeed. You know kind of got out of control there. I feel like uh, his closing line, let's have a policy debate. Maybe that is a good point. You know, I, I, he's having to I defend liked himself to, up there. I would have liked to have seen a policy debate this entire, wait a minute, it's called a debate? <laughs> Are they talking about policies? Well, uh, they're not really debating each other on any policies. Like Tim I, Scott, like I really like the guy as a senator, but then he comes in this attack out of nowhere, it seems. Uh, going after Vivek like that when you were discussing policy and then you go and switch it all to uh, I, I, a, a personal attack. Right, ad hominem attacks. Now, I will say I do, I do appreciate a rigorous debate. I appreciate uh, when people kind of get to go back and forth and they get to really argue about some of these things. But again, when it's just these ad hominem gotcha attacks and... Well, it wasn't yeah. even about immigration. It was about the vague saying they're all paid and bought for. Right. Bought and paid for. Bought and paid for, yeah. And he didn't prove him wrong. Nothing he said 
They didn't. Con they didn't contest. Even that. if Vivek. Yeah, Save but, a vacant. Yeah, but you you had a business in China. Right. You went to China. And, and then slavery. you got out of there. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> and where? Nikki Haley. <laughs> and where is uh, most of the manufacturing done for American businesses? China. China. So, All right. So how many American businesses will fail when Americans take out Chinese manufacturing? Um, I Something think it's kind of a uh, flip situation from 2016, whereas Donald Trump was older, established in multiple industries, and he went and he attacked the bought and paid for politicians and got away with it. Right. And won the presidential election in 2016. Vivek does not have the business track record. Yes, he has a great business track record at this point, but not as lengthy as Donald Trump says, and he tried to pull the same Donald Trump tactic and saying they were all bought and paid for. Only difference is Vivek didn't give them any money. Whereas if you remember in that first debate with Donald Trump, he expressed how he paid the politicians and the politicians listened to him and all the other nominees were just like, <laughs> none of them said a word. The whole stage was quiet. Uh -huh. But Vivek just cannot pull uh, the Trump like that. He doesn't have the, uh, the notoriety, That's the, the age of service, of if you mm -hmm. will. Mm -hmm. He didn't go from uh, one business to a totally different industry like Trump did with, uh, with buildings and investments and then into uh, media the way he did. But yeah, I think that Tim Scott uh, attack was definitely a ding for Tim Scott for me. Same. Keep it, on, keep it on point, Scott. That's right. So next up, Dana Perino brings in Mike Pence to discuss the ADA, Obamacare. Let's see how that one goes down. China's Vice President Pence. $5 Just last month, Vice President Pence, you said if elected, you would repeal all Obamacare mandates. However, you also made that same promise in 2016. And at that time, Trump Pence had congressional majorities for at least the first two years, and you did not deliver on that promise. So Obamacare, right now, it is more popular than ever. Why should Americans trust you, if you become president, to fix that, or is Obamacare here to stay? Well, first let me speak to the mass shootings issue, and then I'll answer that question. It's an important one, Dana. Look, I'm someone that believes that justice delayed is justice denied. And as the father of three, as the grandfather of three beautiful little girls, I'm, I am sick and tired of these mass shootings happening in the United States of America. And if I'm president of the United States, I'm going to go to the Congress of the United States, and we're going to pass a federal expedited death penalty for anyone involved in a mass shooting so that they will meet their fate in months, not years. It is unconscionable that the, the, uh, the Parkland shooter, Ron, is actually going to spend the rest of his life behind bars in Florida. That's not justice. We have to mete out justice and send a message to these would-be killers that you are not going to live out your days behind bars. You're going to meet that. justice in this system. But does that mean Obamacare is here to stay? <laughs> Well, thank you for reiterating the question, because I'd love to answer it. Look. So former Vice President Mike Pence can't even answer the question because he had an attack for DeSantis already pre-set up in his head. Yes. Um, well, they had mentioned uh, something about school shootings previous to that. Right. That he was wanting to, like, go back to. Yes, because uh, in this debate, we know that since uh, there are six candidates up on stage, they're only asking one to three candidates a question per topic and bouncing around from there, which I think is doing uh, Americans a huge disservice. So thanks a lot, Fox Business, for not letting us hear what every candidate thinks about every topic that's important to us. There's got to be a better way. I will say this. When I hear a presidential candidate talk about expedited death penalties it always makes me a little nervous. Um, that's the kind of thing that can get out of hand very quickly. That's not something we want to give the government expedited power to do. Now, I will say, 
uh, if you find somebody in the act of a school shooting or just finish the act of a school shooting, I don't see any reason why they should be arrested at all. How about expedited there? How about the cops just take care of business when they show up? Um, I would be in favor of that. I don't think anybody would mind. Uh, I don't care if they put their hands up or put their gun on the ground and say, I surrender. I never understood how catching somebody in the act of committing a crime, they still have the right to a judge and a jury. Like, if you're caught molesting a child, you should die on the spot. Oh, I mean, I agree with that, if too. If you are to shoot um, innocent children at a school, you should just be shot. If you're busted in the moment, in the act of, you should no longer be in society. And I think that would be accepted. I think that, that nobody's going to complain about that. But you give the government a law that says they can expedite the death penalty, that might not go just as you plan. Oh, agreed. Yeah, well, locking people up for the rest of their lives hasn't worked out too well for us either. So we got the incarceration, we got the illegal immigration, where we're trying to kick people out that are here illegally, lock up or kill criminals as fast as possible. This is a shit show. <laughs> Very exciting. All right. Next question for Governor DeSantis. Over 26 million Americans can, don't have insurance coverage. Governor DeSantis. Two and a half million of them are in your state. That's worse than the national average. Can Americans trust you on this? Well, I think this is a, a symptom of our overall economic decline. Everything has gotten more expensive. You see insurance rates are going through the roof. People that are going to get groceries. I spoke with a woman in Iowa, and she said, you know, for the first time in my life, uh, I'm having to take uh, things out of my grocery cart when I get to the checkout line because the, the total goes up so quickly. Sure. So this is very real, and people are hurting out there. So we've got to address the underlying problem with Bidenomics, the overspending, taking all Biden's rules and regulations. I'm going to throw them in the trash can on day one. You're not going to have to worry about that. We're going to open up all of our energy. We will be energy dominant in this country that will lower your gas prices. And what we need to do with health care is recognize our health care is putting patients at the back of the bus. We have big pharma, big insurance, and big government, and we need to tackle that and have more power for the people and the doctor-patient relationship. Governor, why is your record in Florida on insurance worse than the national average? It's not, it's our, our state's a dynamic state. We've got, we've got a lot of uh, folks that come. Of course, we've had a population boom. We we also don't have uh, a lot of welfare benefits in Florida. You know, we're basically say we want to, this is a field of dreams. You can do well in the state, but we're not going to be like California and have massive numbers of people um, on government programs without work requirements. We believe you work and you got to do that. And so that goes for all the welfare benefits. And you know what that's done, Stuart? Our unemployment rate is the lowest amongst any big state. We have the highest GDP growth events any big state. And even CNBC, no fan of mine, ranked Florida. Florida, the number one economy in America. So I'll tell you what, I think uh, Ron DeSantis' prepared answers have been on point all night. Um, that is his strong suit. He's, you know he's practiced these answers several times. It's probably what him and his wife do when they get home every night is just practice him rattling off all these answers. Yeah, I think uh, his focus groups are doing very well. And his consultants. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did like his, the... his preparation in and of itself. And I mean, the policies, I can't argue against either. Like, yeah, I want less insurance and less um, government involvement in health care. So I can make the deals with me and my doctor and hopefully find the best possible doctor for the medical care that me and my family needs. I kind of wish he had stuck with that. And that's what the question was about. Right. About how insurance, the system works, um, and how, again, taking it back to that doctor-patient relationship, and he's kind of, you know, I do like the idea that in uh, Florida, they're, they're doing great they're economically, and that they have work requirements for welfare. That's all fantastic stuff. 
uh, that you're doing as governor, maybe stay governor and keep doing that stuff. I want to hear about how you're going to solve the problem of these insurance companies, which are jacking up health care costs where you go to the hospital, you're paying ridiculous amounts for Tylenol, and the insurance companies are so tied in with the federal government and Congress and their lobbyists and the pharmaceuticals. It's a big mess. Well, and the and admin, he wasn't addressing it. The, the, admin, the administrative costs for a doctor to be underneath all these regulations to fill out all the Obamacare paperwork just increases the cost exponentially, which um, I thought he made a good point saying that uh, they were not a welfare, huge welfare state. Uh, they do help the people that need help, but they do have the work work now. Yeah, the, they do have the work requirements um, where when you think of it, who's living off of a set income? Mostly retirees. Well, which state has the most retirees? If it's not Florida, they at least have all the snowbirds. So with the retiree population that they have, they already have a set income. They aren't, they're already on to Medicare and Medicaid in their retirement. So they don't need uh, a health insurance plan. However, with the huge population boom that Florida has had, then I would say the people that are moving there either have jobs or going to get insurance through jobs or work that out one way or the other. It's a, it's a big problem. I'd love to hear somebody actually yeah. address it. Indeed. I think a lot of the costs, yeah, just come from too much administrative bureaucracy, um, government regulation. But if you just let people do what they want to do uh, for other people that is helpful, then um, there shouldn't be anything standing in the way or trying to snag a few bucks off the top of that transaction, like the government tends to do between patients and doctors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Healthcare is not a right. You only have the right to care for your health. You're not entitled to have some doctor do something for you for free. That's right. But you are entitled to take care of your health and find the best ways to do that without government interference. Yeah, think about it this way. Yeah, you can't um, force a doctor to operate on you. And if you did, would he even want to operate on you properly? All right, next we got uh, Governor, former Governor Chris Christie and Governor Ron DeSantis, um, both discussing education. On the subject of education, a question for Governor Christie. Students in your state are getting high marks on their report cards, but minorities are not doing well with math and reading. Black and Hispanic students averaging 29 points lower than white students in New Jersey. Would you address minorities first? You have to address all students. And look, in our state, Stuart, frankly, before I was governor, that gap was close to 50%. And what we did was institute more charter schools and more renaissance schools and more public school choice in New Jersey with innovative solutions in cities like Camden, where now we took what was the worst school district in America during my time, and we have now increased that by nearly 40 percent in terms of their proficiency. It can be done when you give people choice. But let's tell the truth to everybody about what this is. This public school system is no longer run by the public. It is run by the teachers' unions in this country. Randy Weingarten and her crew are absolutely strangling. They are taking the worst of their members and defending them rather than advocating for our kids. And when you have the President of the United States sleeping with a member of the teachers' union, there is no chance that you could take the stranglehold away from the teachers' union every day. They have an advocate inside the White House every day for the worst of their teachers, not for our students to be the best they can be. A President of the United States has to take on the teachers' union. I did it in New Jersey. And I will do it as President of the United States. Governor DeSantis, I have a question for you. Governor DeSantis, I have a question for you. Florida's new Black History curriculum says, quote, slaves develop skills which in some instances could be applied for their personal benefit. You have said slaves develop skills in spite of slavery, not because of it. But many are still hurt. For the sentence of slaves, this is personal. 
What is your message to them? So first of all, that's a hoax that was perpetrated by Kamala Harris. Uh, we are not going to be doing that. Second of all, that was written by descendants of slaves. These are great black history scholars, so we need to stop playing these games. Here's the deal. Our country's education system is in decline because it's focused on indoctrination, denying parents' rights. Florida represents the revival of American education. We're ranked number one in the nation in education by U.S. News and World Report. My wife and I, we have a six, five, and three-year-old. This is personal to us. We didn't just talk about universal school choice. We enacted universal school choice. We didn't just talk about parents' bill of rights. We enacted the parents' bill of rights. We eliminated critical race theory, and we now have American civics and the Constitution in our schools in a really big way, just like President Reagan asked for in his farewell address back in 1989. Florida is showing how it's done. We're standing with parents, and our kids are benefiting. All right. I'd say one of his stronger moments of the night. Well, first we had uh, Chris Christie. Oh, yes. Starting with him and uh, the uh, apparently the state of New Jersey education system was in a bad spot and he was able to improve it with the New Jersey State Congress at the time he served. That's what I gathered. But him just coming right out and telling the American public, the public is not in charge of the public schools. They're ran by the unions. And I guess he was talking about Pence's wife because she's a member of the teachers union or who was he talking about there? Um, or DeSantis's wife? He said in the White House. He was talking about some, one of his other... Uh, I thought he was opponents. talking about currently. And with Dr. Jill Biden is part of the unions. Okay. Myarchus, I'm not I'm, 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 quite sure. Something like that. However... Um, yeah, I know Mike Pence had a nice little joke. He's like, he's been sleeping with the same teacher for over 30 years. It's his wife. That joke totally fell flat. It really did. It really did, yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's one of these... I mean, I saw where he was going with it. It's like, kind okay, of these, your wife probably didn't appreciate it either. These gotcha questions they're doing all night. Um, our entire education... And this is something Christy actually, to his benefit said initially was I got to worry about all students not just minority students, students from marginalized right. groups or minorities or whatever Agreed. you want to call it which is the correct answer um, is it the president's job to figure out how to get black kids test scores up like what are we talking about well, here? So, yeah. so many of them talk about school choice and closing or uh, reducing the size of the Department of Ed Education Reducing the size of the Department of Education. Or reducing the size of the Department of Education. But it hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. uh, there was an interview, I know, with Betsy DeVos, the previous Department of Education secretary, with uh, the CEO of PragerU, and discussing how when she was in that role, she was pushing as much as she could um, those monies to be decided at the state level. I did think that DeSantis was wise to pull it back. They threw him some off-topic question about what do you say to the descendants of slaves because of some quote he made that was a gotcha that apparently Kamala Harris, I don't know the whole deal there. He pivoted back to education, which I think was wise. It was one of his strongest moments of the night, I thought, talking about what all they'd done in, go, and, uh, what all they'd done in Florida with school choice and um, the, the Parents' Bill of Rights and those kind of things. I thought that was good. As far as the slavery question, again, what are we talking about? The descendants of slaves, that's just what they throw out. Don't they realize that we're all descendants of slaves? It's true. Every single person on this planet. That's right. And some part of their lineage. One way, shape, or slaves. another. Unless you're a bloodline of monarchs, maybe if you're the Rothschilds, you were never a descendant of slaves. But I guarantee you every one of us was. So, come on, man. Come on. Well said. What are we doing? Let's talk about policy. Yeah, the uh, even talking about slavery. If we're not talking about modern day slavery, um, I mean, they could have clarified human that. trafficking, they could sex have said trafficking, American descendants of American slaves. Like, give me some at least. Like, these are For just sure. these are just you know sound bites from the moderator, followed by sound bites from the politicians. Well, when it comes to public education, uh, some of my viewers already know uh, I am a homeschooler. I am a homeschooling advocate. Uh, Number one reason is it keeps the families together. 
because the public school system, since I guess the 70s, like once you went to a dual income household being the norm, especially through 80, the 80s of Reagan years, you had more divorce, you had divorcees getting remarried after children, sometimes having more children, and so you have an expanded family, and where's the mom and dad? They're both at work. Where are the kids? They're out of public school. So you spend more than two-thirds of your entire childhood in the public school system, maybe a third of the time at home sleeping and hanging out with your parents and friends, and you get the weekends and summers too, but you spend your whole life in the government system and you wonder why kids are against their parents, why wives are against their husbands, and just the downfall of society. I think uh, if you were to eliminate public schools and families just had to figure out their own education, that would be uh, an amazing lesson, a very interesting way to see how things would work out. But at the bare minimum, getting the federal government out of education, sending it back to the states, um, might give me an inkling of saying, hey, maybe I don't have to homeschool. Maybe there is a good public school option out there. But the way things are right now, there's no public school options out there that I would feel um, not only comfortable with sending my son to, but knowing that he would be safe, knowing that he'd be learning the things that he needs to learn to make it in life. I'd be more confident in that if more of those decisions were done at the local level. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, again, props to DeSantis for pivoting back to that. Like, this is the kind of things we need to be discussing that they can work on. Again, uh, Governor DeSantis, you know that slavery is bad. Tonight you have not said that slavery is bad. What would you say to people that have read about slavery? I'll tell you that every American's a slave because we're $30 trillion of debt as a country. So we're all slave to our $30 trillion of national debt until we get all of our government politicians to f pay the bill <laughs> out of their own pocket. <laughs> yeah. Well, they could afford it. Probably. If anything, yeah. If you take all the money from every government employee that's been spending the $30 trillion that were in debt, would you recoup it all? But then we know that's not how debt works, right? It's just debt. We'll just keep passing the buck. All right, let's get to the next one. Well, we hadn't heard from uh, Doug Bergman yet tonight, so let's go ahead and get his question. Old Dougie B. I have a question I think you're going to really like, or at least you have experience in it. And we need to talk about America's farmers because there is a foreign policy connection here. The U.S. and China are in this fierce economic competition. It's hurting American businesses. And there is blowback against American farmers because China then targets them in retaliation. How would you as president protect American farmers and ranchers from that kind of retaliation from a foreign government like China? Well, first of all, we've got the best farmers and ranchers in the world right here in America. If they have a level playing field, they can outcompete anyone in the world. But this is part of the larger issue that we're talking about here, which is we're in a Cold War with China. The Biden administration won't admit that. But we're also in a economic war through the, what we're doing with agriculture and energy. And we're also in a war with them relative to cyber war. We get attacked every day in North Dakota, every state, every school district, our tribes all being attacked every day by either China, Russia, Iran or North Korea. And now we've got a Biden administration whose whole policy is appeasement. They're out there, you know, creating the world, making it less safe. Six billion dollars they traded for five people. They've just now set a price on anyone's head who's a tourist from America, who's a student from America for a kidnapping. If you want more kidnapping, put a price on it. And then that's and they're also helping Iran get to have more uh, closer to nuclear weapon, than the, which pushes all of the Middle East closer to China and Russia. The whole thing is absurd. And then, of course, we're going to give Ukraine to Russia and then we're going to give Taiwan to China and think that's a foreign policy, that will make our nation less 
less successful, make us more poor. And at the core of all that is energy policy because China imports 10 million barrels of oil a day. They're the largest import in the world. And we've had four cabinet members from the Biden administration there this summer, and none of them talked about U.S. energy. The first one to go to each of those countries was Kerry to talk about the folly of the climate climate policy, which is making the world less stable. It's empowering dictators. It's not about climate change that we need worried about. It's about the Biden climate policies that are actually the existential threat to America's future. I feel bad for Governor Doug Burgum. Um, that, I, that was one of his uh, weakest moments of the night. I thought he had. But some it was good the ones. only direct question he received the entire night. I know he and had he to like not, pipe in a couple of times. Like, he, he, in there. like in the very beginning, he spoke up and he got himself heard. And then once the question was directly to him about farmers. He went to CCP, went to Iran <laughs> nukes. He just tried to cram his entire prep package into his answer on that one question. He did get around to making a good point at the end, which was that the climate policies are the real threat to American farmers. He didn't sure. get farmers in there, but yes, I think that uh, these the bans on fertilizer spending. and fossil yeah. fuels is... Crazy! You'll just starve the whole country if you really enacted some of those. Well, the whole ideas. world. With I mean, apparently the whole reason we're in Ukraine right now is because they're the breadbasket of the world. Which before this war, I had never heard that before. Oh yeah, a huge wheat supplier, definitely one of. The, I mean, maybe the second largest. It had largest. never during the entire Trump administration never heard about it. In fact, you know what? Never even heard about Russia trying to get in to Ukraine under Obama. I remember Russia going into Crimea, and I believe still have Crimea. And then during the Biden administration, they went into the Donbass region of Ukraine and are still there. So what changed between Joe Biden, vice president, and there's all this information about Ukraine to four years of Ukraine who? During Trump to another not only three years of Ukraine, 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 but Russia is taking more of the Ukraine land. So it seems like it is a huge um, money grab by yeah. everybody in government. As and always. And I would say with the farming. military, industrial complex, sure, all those businesses too. I would say with the farming, um, you know, it's energy independence is huge, um, al allowing fertilizer and some of these other methods of farming, uh, getting rid of those regulations that, that shut down on that, this climate stuff. Um, you know, we can be dominant. We have the most uh, uh, healthy, arable land in the whole world in this country, um, you know, with all sorts of geographies and topographies and waterways sure. that connect them and you know, I don't I don't think we're going to be in danger of running out of food unless we do stupid stuff like banning fossil fuels and fertilizers and whatnot because they came from. Well, yeah. You know. And during like the covid lockdowns, uh, Governor Whitmer had banned the sale of seeds so people couldn't garden and farm in their own yard, yeah. making their own food. Yeah. Like if there's any dictator looking to do that, you know, they just got to go. I mean, I, my performance is maybe not top-notch tonight, but I think we're doing better than they are. Uh, I think we are, too. Let us know. This is fun. Let us know in the comments below. Like, I'm subscribe, share this video. Oh, goodness. How are we doing? How are we doing? Well, you know who the real winner of this whole thing is? The real winner of this whole debate, I think, has to be Dana Perino. Here, we have, we have no, the, I, I think millions. we're going to go on. You have to ex we have, we have of all these this, questions. This, we're going to get to you. We're going to come back to you. No, There's a lot of time. about child care and nobody answered the question. In North Dakota. You're all auditioning for the job as president of the United States. You want to earn these votes. But the world's problems land in the Oval Office. During the presidential debates in the year 2000, Neither Al Gore nor George W. Bush was asked about Al-Qaeda. Yet, just one year later, Al-Qaeda's attack on September 11th claimed nearly 3,000 lives. And the farther we get from September 11th, the closer we are to September 10th. Senator Scott, you have no executive branch experience. What has prepared you to protect the nation from a major 
man-made national security crisis. Uh, Senator Scott, the national debt has nearly doubled in your time in office. The approval rate for Congress is at a mere 19 percent. If this were a business, you'd probably all be fired in Washington, but you're here tonight looking for a promotion. In 2013, Governor Haley hired you for the Senate. I'd like you to tell her why you should be promoted to CEO of the nation instead of her. It's now obvious that if you all stay in the race, former President Donald Trump wins the nomination. None of you have indicated that you're dropping out. So, which one of you on stage tonight should be voted off the island? <laughs> Please use your marker to write your choice on the notepad in front of you, 15 <laughs> seconds, Starting now, of the people on the stage, Are you who serious? should be? I'm I'll absolutely to do serious. That with all due respect, wow. I mean, we're here, like, you know, we're happy to debate, sure. but I think that that's disrespectful to my fellow competitors. Nobody wants yeah. to. I, nobody wants to participate. Let's do some questions. Let's talk about the future of the country. I'll answer. I want to be. I want to be clear. Let me ask you this. If, if I may. Let me, if I may let me ask you something. Yep. Let me, then, yep. if you won't answer that question, let me ask you this one. Yeah. What is your mathematical path? Yes. Governor DeSantis in order to try to beat President Trump, who has a commanding and enduring lead in this race. So polls don't elect presidents. Voters elect presidents. Right. And we're going to take the case of the people in these early states. We're going to do it in a state-by-state -state direction. And why? Because as Reagan said in his day, this is our time for choosing. We are not getting a mulligan on the 2024 election. Republicans have lost three straight elections in a row. We were supposed to have a red wave with inflation at 9%. It crashed and burned. Not in Florida, it didn't. We delivered it in Florida. And so we've got to choose right. We've got to win. And we need somebody that's going to be able to serve two terms. So in January of 2023, they'll be able to address the nation saying, we turned the economy around, we secured the border, and we fended off the threat from communist China. As your president, I will get that job uh, done. Governor Christie, I believe I did see you write something here. Governor Christie, I believe, excuse me, Governor Christie, I believe I did see you write something on the card. No, no, but I'll certainly tell you. Go. Okay. Yeah. Look, I think I've been the only one on this stage who's been clear about this. I vote Donald Trump off the island right now. And the reason I vote him off the island, you and there were, and, but, any of the, no, of the people no, on the stage, you know what? every person on this stage has shown the respect for Republican voters to come here to express their views honestly, candidly, and directly, and to take your questions honestly. I have respect for every man and woman on this stage because they've done it. Vivek, put your hand down for a second, would you? Um, I still got, I still got time, dude. So, so chill out. Um, here, look. This guy has not only divided our party, he's divided families all over this country. He's divided friends all over this country. I've spoken to people, and I know everyone else has, who have sat at Thanksgiving dinner or at a birthday party and can't have a conversation right. anymore if Governor, they disagree with Donald Trump. Governor he needs to be voted off the island and he needs to be taken out of this can process. Can we get the debate 15 seconds? I, I seconds. Right. The you have 15 seconds, Vivek. I appreciate it Look. I have a different view on this. I think Trump was an excellent president, but the America first agenda does not belong to one man. It does not belong to Donald Trump. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to you, the people of this country. And the question is, who's going to unite this country and take the America first agenda to the next level? When we rallied behind the cry to make America great again, we did not just hunger for a single man. We hungered for the unapologetic Mr. pursuit Ramos of excellence. Ramos. So yes, I will, I will respect are, are. Donald Trump and his legacy because it's yep. the right thing to do. But we will You're. unite this country to take the America first agenda to the next level. And, and that will take a that, different that generation does to do it. it. For that does it. I repeat, that does it. And that does it. Um, I did like Dana's line uh, about if this was a business, you'd probably all be fired. But here you are asking for a promotion. One of my favorite lines of the debate. For, for sure. sure. Definitely. Uh, very good. Very true. Um, so I thought that was great. As far as the uh, voting people off the island, I like DeSantis' response. Oh, this is DeSantis silly. DeSantis had to do the same thing in the first debate, too. I forget the circumstances specifically that the moderators were trying to uh, do the same thing, pitting them all against each other in that way. And it was just wanting to see the fight, not actually debate any policies. 
And so that's one thing where this Main Street media, even in Fox News or Fox Business, is messing it up. I will say I appreciate this approach more than the gotcha questions. Um, when they're specifically designed or these high ad hominem attacks just to trap somebody. I think that, you know, maybe we could add some fun and games to it. Maybe they do get voted off the island. I'd like to see Chris Christie and Mike Pence go toe-to-toe -to -toe gladiators, right? American well, Ninja. I want to have a partisan penalty button buzzer. You get, you well, get. I'll tell you exactly right now, out of those six people, if they all would have done it, the vague Ramaswamy would have been voted off the island because all the other five are all establishment career politicians. And they are afraid of him. And so by definition, I don't think that would have been a smart way to go. If they would have gone after Vivek for being a younger version of a Trump-like character, okay, that would have maybe been a line of attack they could have tried. But um, the way that they were going after him just didn't make sense. And then going after each other, setting up Nikki Haley against Tim Scott against each other, just it's pointless. Yeah, because, okay, there is a point. Because the, uh, let's see, the first one, first primary is in Iowa. Second one is in New Hampshire. Third one is in South Carolina. Correct. So now answer me this. Why did the GOP agree to have two people, Nikki Haley and Tim Scott, both from South Carolina, join the presidential race? So when we keep this in mind, we have a GOP establishment, we have a DNC establishment, and they're the gatekeepers. For all Americans, whether you're independent, don't vote, or you are a Republican or Democrat. There's only two parties. If you're a Libertarian, Green Party, your choices are still being made by the GOP and the DNC. That's right. You, there's only two parties, and there's actually only one party. You know, The reptiles shamelessly claw <laughs> for the loot, and the demons are wrapped in a cheap altruistic suit. They blend together in the circle of loyalty. Your red and blue starts to look like the purple of royalty. I was just going to say two sides to the same <laughs> coin, but I mean, that was definitely more beautifully said. <laughs> what a mess. What did you think about Vivek and his outgoing, the last statement of the debate? Uh, Vivek about, is solid. About, about Trump. No, specifically oh. his comments about Trump at the end. What were your thoughts on that? Oh, Giving respect to your elders as the younger person, especially on stage like that, I think was a huge boost for him. Do you think it was pandering um, to Trump supporters? Or I do think, you think he's sincere. It, he could regard? already have back room deals with Trump, and that's the whole reason he's in it. But then again, so could everybody on that stage. Like in 2016, Trump was going up against 20 other people, right? Or 21. I, I think Something they started crazy. like 22 yeah. people in the first uh, round of GOP in 2016. So if Trump's using his same strategy from then, since he ran um, unopposed basically in 2020, being an incumbent, he's using the same strategy he used to get elected in 2016 by stacking the deck so that way during the primaries, all the votes are split. Which will, just like last time, when all of them start dropping off, like the last time, Rubio and Ted Cruz, I think, were two of the last uh, ones standing. But even they gave up against Trump. And so we'll probably see the same thing here where we'll get down to a, another three or four of the six that were there here tonight. And Trump still won't show up. He doesn't need to. According to the polls. But that's but why he I like, should. But that's why I like what Ron DeSantis said is he said polls don't elect presidents. Voters do. Voters do. Or well, technically somebody. You know, well, the voters. <laughs> yeah, and then the we media. Go, then we the go, political parties. Maybe the lobbyists, the big donors, super PACs. Well, this actually goes into a question with uh, a stolen election or manipulated election tactics. Um, it's that since we do have an electoral uh, system, it is those electors that are actually casting the votes. And those people were the ones that Mike Pence previously said he could not overturn in order for Trump to have won 2020. Now, I don't think Mike Pence was overturning them. He was sending them back to the states to be verified and checked out against their state voting laws. 
And so as sketchy as that was in 2020, I think 2024 is going to be even sketchier. But at least uh, people like Ron DeSantis have said, you know what? Do the mail-in voting. You vote as soon as you get that ballot so we oh, can I start Oh, I saw ads banking. for it. I saw ads for it during the debate. Of bank the vote. Bank the vote. Like, get because your vote in early. Because one thing Trump did in 2020 is wanted everybody to vote the day of. Did he know that some of these machines were going to be rigged? That it was going to be stolen from him? Like, there's some... 40 chess going on that I still don't fully understand. <laughs> yeah. Um, question for you. It'll be a very interesting uh, primary season. And if our general comes down to a repeat of Trump versus Biden, uh, I might just sit out. I don't even know. Out of all the people on the stage, who would you like to see debate Trump one-on-one? -on -one? Who on stage... Who on stage could debate Trump one on one? Um, honestly, I don't think I would like to see anybody no? <laughs> debate him. Um, we all know that Trump fights dirty. Right. Trump's a dirty fighter. The only um, person that can fight even close to dirty enough is going to be Chris Christie. Right. And Chris Christie's been going after Trump this whole time right. and hasn't touched him. Right. Until this Donald Duck thing, which <laughs> I thought fell flat, but apparently a lot of people think it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I used to. Uh, <laughs> hey, Uncle John, if you see this video, I uh, could use a Donald Duck voice. Appreciate it. <laughs> what about Joe Biden? Out of all the people on the stage, who would you like to see debate Joe Biden? Actually, uh, Joe Biden, I'd just be happy if he went up against RFK Jr., who uh, is getting ready, apparently, to announce an independent run instead. Since, once again, the DNC has shut him out. That's what I think we deserve. We deserve to see Biden debate RFK. We deserve to see Vivek debate Donald Trump. Let's really hear it. I want to hear the mudslinging. Well, you said the Vivek. I would, on that note, I would say... For a final three debate, if I could see Trump, DeSantis, and Vivek, I would be very interested to see that. That would be good. Maybe even throw in Nikki Haley. Uh, we didn't watch any clips tonight from Nikki Haley, um, but I will go ahead and make sure the audience sees some. Maybe we'll uh, come back and talk about it. It seemed like she had three or four really good uh, policy stances, but then her relentless attacks on other people on the stage, those three or four ones really turned me off to her. Mm -hmm. No, hate her. Can't stand her. I want her out of politics entirely. If she walked off the edge of the earth, I would be sad. Um, she's, a, not she's, a, she's a war hawk. She's a fear monger on China. She's an establishment neocon through and through from her birth to her blood. She sounded shrill as all the stereotypes of women in politics. Well, women always sound shrill. No, she sounded shrill and upset and combative. And I don't like her. Well, Donald Trump I appointed her off the island. Donald Trump appointed her to be the UN ambassador during his term. Right. His, all his and swamp creatures that he was supposedly going to drain, and he put all the neocons right around him in power. Are you kidding me? Well, if it weren't for her appearance in front of the UN and her uh, basically using Trump's platform to get the UN countries to pay more for the UN defenses... I think was strong. In fact, back then, um, I would have given her a lot more credit and thought she would have been a lot further in this race. I don't. I haven't. I never but watched more, that closely enough to know how involved she was. I know that he was pushing back against UN involvement and expending on UN, and I like that. And I, I know she was spearheading his vision for that. But even from what I've seen tonight, get her out of there. Well, Get her out of there. She's making a bad name for women in politics. Again, I wonder if, like I said, since Trump did appoint her to be the UN ambassador last time around, why is she running up against Donald Trump? Nobody asks any of these people that worked with Trump during his first administration. I mean, Chris Christie has made it very obvious. He didn't get picked for his CIA <laughs> director role or FBI director role or whatever yeah, yeah. DA role that he wanted. And so he turned on Trump because he didn't get 
the job he wanted after trying to support Trump in 2016. Yes, yes, that's interesting. So he's but That would have been a good question. Um, but with uh, Nikki Haley specifically having been the UN ambassador, I think that would have been a very important question, um, which is why I think there are some backroom deals that are set up to make the field look like it looks today. Well, we're going to have to agree to disagree on Nikki. I don't like her. I want. Oh her no! Out. Like I said, if if we're going to a final debate, I want to see Trump to Santos Vivek, because when it comes to their policies and uh, their rehearsed lines, um, DeSantis and Vivek are have been on point during the first debate and the second one. Now they get a little shook up with the other people involved yelling at them or interrupting or don't talk. Don't them. talk while I'm interrupting. What? Yeah, don't talk while I'm interrupting. Wait, <laughs> interrupt the talking. That's actually a good that was line. Funny. I want to use that line. I know it was a flub, but uh, that oh. was pretty good. Don't talk while I'm interrupting. Right. Um, a couple of things we didn't get to. I really liked uh, Tim Scott's line about the great society and welfare and how these were some of the root of our problems of poverty and mental health and that uh, America is not a racist country and his emphasis on that. I thought that was, that was good to hear. I thought it was a strong statement from Scott. I mean, he even made me think, hmm, VP Scott, that could be interesting. His, uh, his non sequitur attack against Vivek kind of soured me on him a little bit, but um, great point there, great point. I do believe that uh, Tim Scott is a good man. Um, and that he does have good uh, policies and um, a good viewpoint in regards to race relations in America today. I totally agree with him on that point. Um, and yeah, his ad hominem attacks, I think that goes back to the backroom deals. Like why, what benefit to his candidacy would that have had? What are his people telling him behind the scenes? That he has to attack Vivek to bring Vivek's numbers down and Tim Scott's up? Because I would say that that interaction, in my mind, did not happen. Yeah, it if didn't anything, help him. It didn't if help anything, him. every time Tim Scott or Nikki Haley attacked Vivek, uh, Vivek went up in my mind. Yeah. He, yeah. Uh, they he didn't, rolled didn't with those good punches left and right, and I think he did a good uh, job deflecting or answering when he had the opportunity to. Yeah, and he got railroaded, so... I'm. You know, I feel for the guy. Um, one other thing, I thought that he had a good answer about um, the banning of child mutilation. Definitely. He said, this, this trans and thing a is a mental did. illness. We need to ban child mutilation. I think that that is absolutely 100% something that we should be working on is to stop this madness well, and as where a children are being indoctrinated or worse, treated with drugs or even surgery. It's, it's crazy, and I was glad to hear him emphatically speak out against that. And somebody else did, too. I think DeSantis, yeah. maybe, yeah. or whatever. But. I think they were all in agreement on stage for, mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. for that part of it. But he said, um, this is a mental illness. That's hate speech in Canada. Mm. You'd get arrested for saying that in Canada. Well, and I thought that was The strong. mental health conversation I'll have to uh, push off to another day, because yes. it's a... In my opinion, is a subjective medicine with no objective value to it whatsoever. Yes. If anything, maybe it's not mental health, it's spiritual health that people need to start focusing on. If you have a better spiritual health, your mental health will follow along. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will say this was a lot more fun than actually watching the debate uh, by myself. Um, Same with here. a bottle. Um, this, is, this has been good to discuss it and analyze it. And it'll be interesting to see where this goes. Do you um, think any of the people on stage will be Trump's VP? <sighs> or do you think they're all vying for cabinet positions? I don't know that Trump's going to make it. I know he's the leader in the polls. I know he seems like a sure thing. I know that every person in Washington, D.C. is doing everything in their power to try and take him out and take him down and stop him from running. And I know the country's sick of the division. And I know the people are fed up with his vulgarity as a human being, his lack of a healthy soul. Yeah, he may have been a great president and what we needed at the time and may have been the only person able to withstand the slings and arrows of all the establishment that was thrown at him. 
but can't we just have something else? Can't we go to something a little better? Um, yeah, I'm over Trump. Um, He's a vaccine salesman. Well, he is now. a vaccine salesman. And that is what really got me uh, was, um, you know, I can give Donald Trump credit for his first three years of service, economy booming, uh, lowest unemployment rate against everybody across uh, energy independence. Cutting taxes, uh, cutting regulations. Uh, regulation and tax cutting. Smaller definitely. government bureaucracy. Yes. Um, and no wars. New well, wars even started. With the pan- even with the pandemic, like I'll, I'll knock him quite a bit, but the first thing I saw was that he showed Americans that it's not the federal government with the power, it's the state governments. So uh, as a knock on former President Donald Trump, he gave Fauci a mic, and that was the dumbest shit I ever seen in my life. And never took it away. And never took it away, and even gave an award on his way out. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for Trump having been swallowed up by the Trump in his last nine months of office, he does not have my vote for a re-election. Did I attempt to vote for him in 2020? Yeah, he was going against Biden. Did I vote for him against Hillary Clinton? Yeah, he was going against Hillary Clinton. <laughs> and after these past three years, if he's the nominee, yeah, I'm going to vote for him over Biden, Newsom, Kamala Harris, yes. etc. Yes. Um, let's however, just, let's just hope. However, if it's <laughs> RFK Jr. on an independent ticket against Donald Trump, I'd like to see him debate. I would I'd like, like to, see to see that him debate. debate. You know what? Throw Biden in there without Chris oh, Wallace yeah. for some help. Yeah, yeah. Is this a schnicken, record schnicken? You know the thing, grash, man. Grash, grash Come snake. on, Jack. Grash, grash, grash. Well, uh, this has been fun. Again, thank you for having me great. on. Uh, Is there anything else? Here, no. I love these cards. I feel like really, you know, we got uh, Quinn's quick picks here and uh, take the next step. These are great, super professional. Look at this, like really real TV people. I like it. I'm doing what I can. I appreciate you coming out. It's a lot more fun talking to somebody than just talking into a camera. No offense, everybody watching. Hope you watch. Hope you enjoyed. Hit like, hit subscribe, share this video. Reach out to Peyton Ware. Would you, do you have anything you'd like to plug while you're here? Oh yeah, uh, check us out, studios at fisher.com, F-I-S-C-H-E-R, that's studios at fisher.com, a, multi-produ- mul- <clears throat> a multimedia production studio, recording studio, sound stage, a uh, really great spot out here in Hill Country. Come check it out if you want to record some music or make some videos. Uh, it's a creative spot you won't want to miss. That was perfect. My friend and colleague, Mr. Peyton Ware, appreciate you coming out. Yes, sir. I appreciate you. And uh, we should do it again. Yeah. I'd I'd be happy to do that. That'd be great. All right. Maybe we'll uh, discuss something a little more fun next time. Mm -hmm. So. I hope we did all right. Yeah. That will be uh, Quinn's Quick Picks with Peyton Ware in the books. And uh, we'll see you next time. Go ahead and take the next step. Take the next step a little bit closer Take the next step with Quinn Take the next step and never stop learning Then you're falling down Then get back up and take the next step again